And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer to the temple, coming to us straight from House Chaos Games, and creators of the upcoming RPG Lords of Chaos, the one and only Randy, don't call, don't call him Michael Hayes. How you doing today, man? <laughs> I'm doing very well. Thank you. Thank you for having me in the monastery. I appreciate it. Thank you for thank you for coming on. So, as a, as a bit of an aside, when I look at the angel of when I look at the angel of light on the um or on the cover, yes, rather the, rather the a um, angel of a god of light. Maybe it's because of maybe it's because of the thing in his chest, but I keep thinking of visionaries. Oh, nice, nice. Which yes. is probably really dating myself by bringing up that, but that's what I'm. <laughs> the way the staff looks and the thing and the thing on his breastplate—that's what I immediately think of for some reason. Yes, I don't yeah. know Why? Well, interestingly enough, that is that is actually the symbol of Raiden, who is the god of darkness and the moon. Um, and uh, Raiden uh, is in opposition to Erethane, who this is the a fallen angel of Erethane. So he's a fallen angel wearing uh, wearing the you know basically the opposition's emblem at that point. Mm -hmm. Is is that is that like what is that like when somebody who's an Oklahoma fan goes to Texas? It is. It is much like that. Yes, and and, and wear the wrong colors. Yes, don't do it. <laughs> or in, or in my case, or in my case, wearing wearing yellow, wearing yellow and green in Minnesota. That's a good way to get yourself in trouble. Nice, nice. Yes, yes. But but I but I have a feeling you don't mind being in trouble. So I'm not so sure you would deliberately avoid that situation. Oh, I um, I I have. I have in at one of my old bit at one of the old places I used to work. We had the joke that there was a thirty percent surcharge for Packer fans. Oh, nice, nice. Um, that that and I make fun. I make fun of every team in every sport that I follow. Of in course, one form or another, because I am an equal opportunity roaster. Indeed, I respect that. It's just some teams in some sports get the get get um. Get the get a bigger shit get a bigger share of the pie because they because they end up giving me more ammo. Um, right, right. Well, some are just easier, right? That is uh, the nature of the beast. Yeah. Um, if I have to use a, if I have to use a Washington example, um, Mar um, Mariners fans probably have to wear cups for the amount of times <laughs> that they get punched in the dick. Oh yes, yes, yes. Yeah, Mar Mar Mariner jokes are a little painful. I have to admit. <laughs> oh. I w and of and of co of course when it comes when it comes to when it comes to the Seahawks well I could I could just I I could just say that Russ is Russ is cooked and I'd get and I'd already get myself some heat yes 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 oh. <laughs> we're we're so close this year a few more games and we would have had it have I ever told you the definition of insanity. You you have not since this is my first time in the monastery and I have much to learn here. You know, Einstein's definition of insanity: doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results. Yes, yes, I, <laughs> that that at least is a familiar one, which doesn't stop me from trying it sometimes. Mm -hmm. But after all, I'm a gamer. Oh, oh yeah. And with that in mind, I'd like to. I usually open with the humble beginnings when I'm when I'm not drinking, of course. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, so I'd li I'd like to kind of go into the origins your origin story when it came when it comes to game when it comes to tabletop gaming and what made it stick. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah, I guess uh, you know, I started uh late 70s. I was living overseas in Japan actually, um playing Go, playing chess, playing all those games and I started building war games without knowing it because i thought these games have no probability you know there's not a lot of flexibility of different you know unit types i mean chess technically does i guess so i started building building war games and i then moved back to the states and discovered uh, this company called avalon hill which built board games so i was buying you know uh, to Brook in 1776 and third reich and starship troopers and um you know so i was just so hooked 
Um, and then, of course, one day uh, the Dungeons and Dragons folks put out their basic box set, mm-hmm. and I bought that. And uh, you know, I was just blown away. I still remember reading the book the first time, and just you know, this whole fantasy world. And I'm still a war game fan. I love war games, but this whole thing of telling stories, uh, interactive storytelling, building a world. Uh, you know, just I, I was I've been hooked since. Uh, you know, on on those kind of games. Mm-hmm. And it is it is interest. The the smartest part of me wants to wants to bring up how, bring up the whole no no unique features when it comes to when it comes to chess pieces. I'm like, wait, you're in Japan and you didn't play shogi. <laughs> yeah, that's a, well, well, you know, I I was playing all the games, but you know, there's something about a war game of. You know, being in different universes, you know, I, I built a space game and I built a, you know, a World War II game. And I, I mean, my first game was a, a go board and the, and the white and black pieces were opposing infantry. And I went to the beach and gathered seashells and used them for armor pieces. And I didn't have any dice. right? So I, I used a ju- juicy fruit wrappers, you know, gum wrappers and wrote combat results on those and threw them in a hat and would draw the, you know, draw the result out of the hat. Uh, you know, so it was, I always had that yearning, I guess, before I even knew formal war games existed. I just had the urge to build them um, mm-hmm. and and I've been building them since. So it's uh, it's it's really fun. I, I love world building. I like mechanics. I like making games um, and I like storytelling. I mean, I've run my campaign for, for Lords of Chaos is it's 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 37 years, maybe a little more than that. It could be 38 technically, but, uh, you know, it's just it's been it's been amazing. We've got a lot of great stories, uh, you know, going back decades. Mm-hmm. And to be fit, to be fit, to be com- to be completely fair, that that tends to that tends to be how these things how these things kind of work. Um, I'm not sure if you saw the documentary Lords of Blackmore, but that that went into a lot more detail about the line that ended up happening between between the war between the war gaming scene of the 70s that would evolve into role playing as we know it. Right. Right. Um. And it all it all started with the Napoleonic campaign. Yep. Yep. Now, with that with that kind of thing in mind, was with Lords of was with Lords of Chaos was it a, was it a case of just a gradual stacking of ideas over the years, just throwing together a bunch of stuff you liked? Yeah, absolutely. I, I you know, and that's probably a common path. Uh, you know, it, it, even even in, in my youngest years of of you know gaming with with D and D, there was things that didn't sit well with me. And and like I said, I love the game. Still still playing some D and D campaigns today. Um, but there was some things missing. So when I got to college, you know, I, I was living with a bunch of you know military. I was ROTC in college. Had a bunch of military friends. You know, we're doing some gaming, living together, and it's like, gosh, you know, we, we all don't like this thing, so and we don't like that thing, so we just started throwing mechanics, and there's a there's a whole file of you know broken mechanics through the years, or great mechanics that don't fit, or and you just keep adding things and see if they work, and you know, modify them, and if they don't work, throw them out, and if they work well enough, you keep them, and that's just it's been a gradual process. Um, you know that I it just I think most of the systems are set at this point. There's still some I, I would love to mess with, but all the core all the core mechanics, all the core things are are settled. Mm-hmm. Um, if you don't mind me asking, when it came to when it came, when it came to those when it came to those early days, were there any, were there any mechanics you can think of that just didn't sit with you? I can think of a um, few, but that's just from my own experiences. Yeah, and I hated armor class, for example. Um, so you, you know, I'm guessing in that same vein, you hated Thaco as well. I hated Thaco. I hated armor class. I I hated the concept of strolling into a fight with a character with 175 hit points and knowing that the opposition could do D8 plus four damage to me if they even hit me, and just like I'm not afraid. And 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 one of the things that I want in my combat is I, I want to be if I'm a if I'm a hero right if I'm super competent if I have a super veteran depending on what venue you want to be in yeah I, I want to be confident in my abilities I want to be able to overcome you know most opponents that that aren't as skilled as I am but I always want there to be that chance right like if I screw up 
if the, the wrong combination of things happen, um, you know, I, I can I can go down, I can get shot, you know, I can get stabbed or whatever. And, and that's why, for instance, in my system, you don't grow in hit points. Mm -hmm. So there's a hit point system, but you don't, you know, if you're if you're the, the legendary hero, you have the same hit points that you had when you were a rookie. And I like that. Now you're better at avoiding damage. I have, I have defense bonus that goes up as you gain experience. There's parrying. So there, there's ways to mitigate or, or avoid damage. But if, if you get caught flat-footed and get hit, you're hit. And you better just hope that, uh, you know, it's not bad enough. Mm -hmm. Which is, an, is a careful balance to make because if you end up going too far, you can, ha you can have what, um, what some of my colleagues have called fantasy fucking Vietnam. Right, uh, right. Right. Where, where, um, where you are, where no matter how good you are, you are completely at the mercy of the of the dice gods. Where even, where all it takes is one right roll, and then you're in the and then you're in the dirt, or you could end up having the superhero problem where you're too powerful, and yeah, there's and there's no threat. Yeah, and I think that that's really the you know the balance you want to achieve is you're supposed to be heroic, right? Mm -hmm. So, so Lords of Chaos characters, this is not realistic. You know, and, and that the the characters in this world are much more survivable than they would be in a real sword fight or you know getting hit with arrows or whatever. But so I wanted the fear without that being exactly that, right? Like it's it's like landing at the beaches on D Day in the first wave. You know, hey, we you know we attacked the lich's lair and you know twenty percent of us made it through the first wave. You know, so so that's what I want to do, and and also I have hit specific locations. So the nice thing about that, from a game mastering perspective, is you can break a leg or break an arm, or or you know take someone out of the fight without killing them, which changes the tactical situation very quickly without having to kill the character. So characters are still hard to kill; they're, they're definitely killable, but it takes the right amount of circumstances, including my damage, even a, even a halberd or something, it rolls a range and that range always has the low of one, you know, one point of damage. Because the fact is in combat, you know, throughout the ages, even looking in the modern era, you know, you can, it's the classic, you can shoot at someone, who, you know, 10 feet away from you, even as someone who knows how to shoot and still miss, right? Or graze them. So I, I like that element of it. If I've been caught flat footed, a giant is swinging at me with a huge club you know, in some systems, well, he's going to automatically do, you know, enormous points of damage. It's like, no, you may get lucky and get a glancing blow, you know, and, and uh, so that, that, it makes it exciting without, and I call those player protection rules, by the way, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, it's, the damage always starts with one, and there may be a modifier, you know, a damage modifier, so maybe the, the minimum will be two, but it, it gives you that chance to be heroic without, hey, if you get hit by something big enough, you're just, you know, you're gone, or that arm or leg are gone, or whatever body part is destroyed. Mm -hmm. And with that, with that in mind, when it came, um, one th one question that I feel I feel I I feel I need to ask when it comes to Lords of Chaos is, given given the given the association with D and D is, are you? Um, I know you're going freeform, you're and you've made a, and you've made a lot of changes, but are you still using a D twenty as your core mechanic? I am not. No, it, it percentile base is the core mechanic. Okay, so um, you're, go, you're going percentile like the majority of T, of TSR's other stuff that they were doing. Yeah, yeah. I just I like the percentile. It's easy to understand, right? If you got a thirty percent chance to do something, it's easy to understand. It's easy to add things to, um, and it also gives me some cool abilities. Uh, you know, for instance, if you have an attack skill with a weapon, and you can have an attack and a parry skill, and and and, and those are separate skills with the same weapon. Um, if you go over a hundred percent with that weapon, uh, you subtract from your opponent's parry. For example, um, it, when you're over hundred percent, you can do called shots. So, which halves your chance to hit, but you'll hit a location. So, if you want to aim for an opponent's head, well, you can you can make that called shot. Um, so, I, I think it just mechanically gives you some some real flexibility and and helps players understand as opposed to D twenty. You know, I'm pretty good at math. You know, I know that each increment on a D twenty is five percent. But I, I you know sometimes you just a thirteen. Okay, what's the, uh, you know you just have to take that moment to think about it. And I'm all about you know, player agency in removing as much of the cognitive load from the player as possible to let them get into either the role playing or the combat or, you know, whatever, be, be immersed in the actual game rather than buried in all these details of trying to figure out all these, you know, arcane uh, issues. Mm -hmm. Now, 
one thing that, one thing that I think is important to nail down, especially when you actually have a set a setting in, as opposed to the shit or get off the pot thing that D and D has had for decades, and I, right. which is one of those things uh, things that I get called on a few times and I will die on that hill. D and D does D and D has it has bullet points, but it does not have a setting. Right. And people people will sometimes bring up that that Mista, that say Mistara is the default setting. If that's the case, it doesn't say so in any of the books. And right. it's not right. the, if it's not in the book, it doesn't count. Like just like if the die rolls off the table, it doesn't count. Yes. Um, yes. But with that with that kind of thing in mind, I think it's important to nail down what sort of fantasy, what sort of what sort of subtype of fantasy Lords of Chaos is gunning for. The way the co the way the cover and the way some of the art ends up presenting, I end up getting a very a very um a very high almost he almost heavy metal like fa almost eighties heavy metal like um fantasy. Is that accurate? Or you I boy, you know, I hadn't thought of it in those terms, but that probably is. It's it's definitely kind of a high fantasy. Um, you know, I, I I am a bit of a child of the '80s, so so I can certainly a, a lot of influence there. And it's really, you know, the 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 style, the art style was was picked to be kind of a comic book style. Yeah, um, and and what I thought, what I thought was interesting about that it was that was my vision without having talked about it to anyone else and then my wife one day when we were talking about art said well i think you should do a comic book style i'm like well that's kind of funny and then someone who was helping me with the stuff who who's a, a professional branding guy said you know hey this little you know i think we really should do some comic book kind of art and i'm like okay if, if if the universe keeps saying comic book art and and the reason that was mentioned for that is because my system is so flexible right it's it's you know, you you select your skills. You you know combat and non combat. So you know it just it has that kind of feel where where anything can happen. You know my characters build amazing backgrounds. They have amazing sources for their magic if they're mages. You know there's there's just so much flexibility to it that I think it really lended itself to that sort of uh, you know sort of aesthetic if you will. Yeah. I will note that when I br when I bring up um, comics, there's a, I'm. In, I'm in particular thinking of thinking of a lot of the fantasy comics that I saw, that I saw on the in, I saw on the indie scene for most of my life, as well as stuff like the stuff like um, John Buscema's run with um, Conan. Yes, yes, absolutely. Which is a ref, is is something I bring up a lot, but I think for a lot of comic book readers, if they if you were to sit, if you were to bring up a fantasy comic, you you'd, you would hear one of two things. On one hand, you would he you would probably hear Savage Sword of Conan. On the other end, you might hear Prince Valiant, although Prince right. Valiant is more historical fantasy than fantasy. Right. But those are those are the two that I hear that I hear the most when it comes to that particular era. And to a lesser to a lesser extent, some of the some of the more fantastical um, album covers I I'd see in heavy metal, especially in power metal in Europe. Ah, uh, yeah. Yep. Yeah, I I love I love that art. I think that's amazing art and and I and I do I do love that feel. Uh I, I love the grittiness, right? I I love the grittiness. The combat system's gritty. Um you know, I I love the grittiness of the game. I love the grittiness of you know the the, the shining heroes who, you know, are, are always pretty and never dirty and and uh, you know everything works is I, I that's that's not my scene, and of course, a game master can run it any way they want. You know, I'm I, I'm not going to pull the you know this is the official way to play Lords of Chaos because the official way to play Lords of Chaos is however the game master and their players choose to play it. Mm -hmm. um, and and in fact, from a design perspective, anytime I I had a a point where I'm like, okay, I've got two ways I can go with this. I I chose the most generic, you know, because I wanted to give the the game masters flexibility. And in a couple places, I do put game master notes in the book of saying, here's how I'm doing this, right? Here's how I'm running this. Um, and I'm definitely planning on afterwards supporting the game. I mean, I've been playing it forever. I'm going to keep playing it until I can't, um, you know, and, and I don't know, you know, people buy for different reasons, some just to support you, some because it's cool, some to put on a shelf because, you know, I have a, a, a shelf of games. But for people out there who actually want to play it, I plan on being involved, you know, in, in, in helping them make those games as awesome as possible. Mm -hmm. Now, with that in with that in mind, the next thing that I, next thing that I wanted to a, wanted to ask in that regard is when it comes is when it comes to character creation and 
I know you've made I know you've made the statement that you are not going to be using classes. What I'm curious about is if you would be using something like archetypes, starting packages and the like. Um, not from a skill set perspective. There are races. So I do have um, the, the classic you know, strength, dexterity, constitution things. Those I call those prime attributes. Mm -hmm. um, and different races have different prime attributes. In fact, it was leveled so that a human, a human all of those prime attributes are at 20. Um, so an elf, for instance would be 22 dexterity as opposed to 20, right? And, and, and but an 18 size and an 18 strength. Um, so the uh, dwarves, elves, humans, I've had, I've just started a new campaign here in January. I have two players playing orcs, which the way prime attribute points work, cause you can build monsters using the prime attributes. They, they are equal to humanoids. So they're balanced with, with the other humanoids and humanoids. I mean, humans, elves, and dwarves. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, so so it's 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 really you can pl you the races have those those specific differences in prime attributes, but other than that, you're picking the skill set. So I don't say, hey, humans happen to be good at X. You know, hey, dwarves have mining and you know gem appraisal or whatever you you want for the system. It's like you go in there and pick that. And if in your world dwarves have mining, then well, you can select that skill, or you can be the dwarf that doesn't have mining. Right? That's why you're out adventuring. All the other dwarves laughed at you, or you know. Um, so yeah, I don't, I, I really, that's where I tried to be just flexible. You know, you, you've got the, you've got the skills, you know, lots of non-combat skills, lots of combat skills, pick the things that work for your vision. And, and that's really it too. A, a few times in the rules early on, I'd say, gosh, it's kind of weird. You know, I'd like mages to be more rare. So let me make some rules that make mages more rare. And every time I did that, you, you'd end up making these, it would affect other rules. There would be a cascade effect. So it'd be like, well, now I have to kind of modify this rule because I've got this weird rule. And then, um, and by the way, I think I don't want to you know, be dashing, you know, bashing the origin game as it were, but I think that's a lot of their problem is from my perspective is that they have these rules that don't really work. And then you're constantly working you know, around them instead of fixing the core problem. Um, so I, I wanted to make that you know, more flexible and I'd say, okay, this rule was my vision and it's affected the, throughout the game. You can see the, you know, see the ill effects as it were. So I'm pulling that out. I'm, I'm, I'm keeping it away from my vision, uh, you know, and, and, and let the game masters decide if the game master decides that magic is super rare, they can impose some restrictions on how they do it. Or, or for instance, magic in my world. I don't say the intelligence helps you with magic, right? Or constitution. I don't declare what helps you with magic. That's for the player to declare or the game master to declare if they want to put some restrictions on there. Um, and I just, the campaign I just finished, I took, put, took my players back to the, to the bronze age of my world and I made magic much more restrictive just to you know, give them a different feel for it. And you had to have, to if you wanted to do direct damage to someone, you had to have a totem of them, right? You had to have a piece of their hair or whatever. So, you know, there, there's lots of things you can do with the core system, um, but the core system is designed to to give you that flexibility. Mm -hmm. And with that, in, with that in mind, since you mentioned skills, this is one. Of, this is one of those things where I have a complicated relationship with. Oh because, no. <laughs> um. Well, first off, let me get let me get one thing out of my system that I know a lot of D and D diehards are go, are going to scream bloody murder at me every time I every time I bring this up because. That because they don't like the truth. D and D should not, was not and is, and has never been designed to have a skill system the way its contemporaries do. Right. I mean, I know some people will bring up the thief skills, but that's more of a class feature for thieves than it is anything else. Right. Oh, what I what I mean by that is the way the way say World of Darkness or Shadowrun or the like have their skill system built into everything. Yep. And when any time D&D &D has tried to put in a skill system, it's always been awkward. But when it comes to skills, there is one other issue and that is bloat. Right. I love Shadowrun to death, but it is but it is my um whipping boy when it comes to this problem because you look at most editions of Shadowrun and there are just way too many skills and the and that that's not even including specializations. And you end up having a bit of choice paralysis, right? So, is that something that you guys ha that you guys have considered during development? Is making sure that the skill list doesn't get excessive. 
Yeah, and, and, and of course, you know, one person's excessive is another person's cornucopia. So, uh, you know, I, I guess that depends on how you define it. But I, the non-combat skills, and some of them are lists, like crafts is a list, and it just lists a whole bunch, right? Um, and the non-combat skill list in the, in the rules, I think there's probably 73, somewhere around there, 73 non-combat skills, right, of different categories of stealth and perception and, and manipulation and knowledge. Um, so is that too much, too little? I don't know. Um, since it's a point buy system, uh, you know, every skill you buy is going to cost you points. I call them fame points, basically experience points. Mm -hmm. um, and to improve those takes points. So you don't automatically go up on those skills. So what you tend to find is that players build their core concept, pick the skills, weapon skills that fit that, pick the, you know, the non-combat skills that fit that. And then occasionally they'll add a few as they go or, or maybe add some opportunistically where they'll say, hey, we're in this part of the world and I decide I'm going to learn this language um, or something. But, but, but really, you, know, you, you don't end up with this list of 20, you know, 30 skills or something. Although I do have one player who likes to put a, you know, a, a couple of fame points into lots of skills uh, in non-combat. But, but you know, power to him. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's, it's designed to, to, to give you, the, the, the skill list is designed to give you choice as opposed to you're going to have 30 of these and not know which one to use. And then, of course, you know, from a game master perspective, it's like a player can always try something that they could try, right? Like if you don't have C as a skill, well, you have eyes, don't you? So, so I, I think those just become generic roles. But uh, yeah, I, I, I agree with you in that, uh, you know, when you have the, the massive skill bloat where I'm scanning down my, my sheet during a combat or, or, or during an encounter, like which of these skills is the one that I have to use, uh, you know, and, and, you know, that I can pull out and I've forgotten half of them because I haven't used them for so long. Mm -hmm. And with that, with that, in, with that in mind, in, I've seen I've seen some instances where get, where there's a ma where there's a massive gap between pe between people who have a between people who have a skill and role and people who don't and some in some worst case scenarios that leads to um signif um a significant again gap between the between um between what somebody is what somebody's able to do and the, um in in worst case scenarios you have people who are over specialized right um so so with with that in mind is there even though it, even though there shouldn't be a huge chance to succeed is there st is there still some is there still a chance to be successful at something even if you don't have the skill Absolutely. Yeah. And, 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 I'm, and I do address that in the rules and that unless the game master rules something impossible, mm -hmm. right? Because I don't like that you think of, well, there's always like a 1%, right? It's a percentile dice system. So there always should be a 1% chance. Well, you know, if I'm a human trying to jump an 80 foot gap, you know, wearing full armor and equipment, I don't think that's a 1% chance. But yeah, I, I'm a believer in that from a game master perspective of, you know, the, the you would let the players play and, and if their character would try to do something and i use c as the, the perfect example right like hey i didn't take the c skill so like i don't have eagle eyes and and, and maybe this really good peripheral vision and see things you know really well but i'm looking down the path you know and and, and there's something there so do i have a chance to see it or i or more likely like i want to try something i want to try to pick a lock right if it was a complex lock and they had no lock picking skill i would say yeah no um but it's like if hey this is a simple lock with like one tumbler in there uh you know they're gonna jam a dagger tip in there i'm gonna let them roll for that and i'm gonna give them a better than one percent chance right I, you know so so i think i think those moments once again of letting players get immersed in the character rather than be locked into into a skill list. And I do like specialization. Uh, you know, I, I don't like it when, when games, when everyone basically is the same. You know, the wizard really does the same thing as the fighter, does the same thing as the, the thief. They just call them different things. You know, I want each player to have their opportunity to shine. And, and I do that deliberately as a game master. I put the players in situation where this is the opportunity, and I don't say that to the players, but you know, this is the opportunity for this one character to really shine. And then you make sure, you, you know, from my perspective, and this is my game mastering philosophy, that I rotate through my players to give them those opportunities um, to do things that no one else in the party can do. And, that, and that's very fun. And of course, it's, it's really satisfying to be, ah, oh, this is the moment I've been waiting for, you know, and step up and, and make it happen. Mm -hmm. Now, with that in mind, when it comes when it comes since you're doing you're doing it's clear you're doing attributes and skills, right? So what I'm what I'm curious about is 
how those play into determining the chance of success for a for a given task. Right. Like how how right. that kind of thing is calculated. Not not involving any situational modifiers, but just ba but just baseline. Yeah, yeah. So so each each skill category is is modified by your prime attributes, right? Be because you know, uh, agility skills are going to be affected by dexterity and such. So, so, so basically, each major skill category, including weapon skills like melee attack, you know, melee, you know, parry, uh, you know, missile weapons, all of those are modified. So, so it takes your primary attributes. You get pluses or minuses depending on you know what what the specific skill is, and then those modify all those skills. So when you when you pick the skill, you may already be at a plus ten or a plus five percent or whatever that number happens to be. Um, so then when you pick the skill itself, the skills you put as you put those points in that increases the the percentile and that gets harder as you go up. Um, so there's there, so there's four skill categories and those are true for combat and non combat skills. There's easy, average, hard, and very hard. Um, and so the easy ones you learn faster, but all of them as you go up, basically every 25%, it you have to put more points in to gain a percentage point of, of that skill. So it becomes easy. Yeah, it's like, hey, I'm, I'm really good. I'm a plus 10 on agility skills. So let me look through the agility skill list and see if there's anything cool that I want there. Um, you know, because that'll be, I put a few points into that and I'm going to be 10 plus, you know, plus that so I can get pretty good at that pretty quickly. Mm-hmm. And with with that with that kind of thing in with that kind of thing in mind, um, when it comes to ma when it comes to magic, if you don't if you don't mind me ma making a bit of a stab in the dark, I am guessing you aren't necessarily a fan of the Vancian model. The, oh, the, no. the spe yes. The spell the spells per day and memorizing all spell your spells and that kind stand. of stuff. Yep, yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's one of the things I did not like about the original D&D &D from day one of like, why, why do I have to have picked a spell and if it's the wrong spell? And, and of course, you know, as, a, as, a, as an early mage in, in that, you, you're going to pick, you know, Magic Missile or something because you know that'll be useful at some point. Um, so, yeah, I, I like flexibility in casting. I, I, I don't want unlimited. I know there's systems that you just choose spell effects and, and I think those can be cool. Um, but I want to give players flexibility uh, not only for the combat spells, but give them enough room so that they could use non-combat skills because that's fun too, right? Instead of the mage, like, hey, it's combat time, let's dust off the mage, you know, break glass and uh, you know, bring the mage out here. It's like I want them to be able to to use those skills in environmental and, and non-combat situations and give them the flexibility to to have enough spells in the repertoire to do that. Yeah, and what I find interesting about that is you look at if you look at most spellcasters in fiction, um, they're not just blasters. Right. Oh, now and granted granted this some of this sometimes even sometimes even the blasty part might be a bit might be asking a bit much depending on the magic system. But in your case, is it in because of the because of that um graphic regarding the regarding the different spheres of magic, would it be fair of me to say that magic use is a skill? Yes, yes. It is, it is considered a combat skill. Mm -hmm. And is it a case where you, where um, there's a baseline difficulty for spells and then you can, mod and then you can modify that with, diff with um, different effects or boosting that spell? Yeah, so so basically, when I did the spell system, I I broke down, you know, what is a spell, right? So first, I ask all the questions like, what what is magic? How does it manifest? Can it be defended against? Right. I, so I, I I have. Uh. Okay, that was weird. <laughs> that was very weird. <laughs> That's so, suddenly it left. So um. But so I guess I guess we'll run from there. Uh, so yeah. So so basically, you know, I, I wrote all these questions about what magic was and how it worked and how it manifested itself, and then I took a spell and broke it down and said, what is a spell, right? Like if you look at all these different systems, what does a spell turn out to be? And a spell turns out to be some sort of base effect, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, I'm reading a mind, or I'm summoning a creature, or I'm causing fire, um, and then. Project it out. It, I call it rad. So basically, range, area of effect, and duration. Right. So I'm putting out to a certain range, a certain area of effect, and a certain duration. And so basically, what a mage does is they grow in power. They grow in their ability to 
gain base spells and more powerful base spells. Um, they also gain in the ability to project that rad to farther. I may have started out at a range of zero or 50 feet, and now I'm out to 100 feet. And I started out at point targets, and now I have a 15-foot diameter radius. So it really lets the mage kind of custom make their spell, and that all I have to buy is, say, the fire effect, to use the classic. I've got the fire effect, and if I throw that on an individual, I mean, I can call it a fire bolt. Um, I can take the same thing and, and make it as an area of effect, and it's a fireball, and I can give it a duration, and it's now a firewall. Um, but it doesn't make the, the player take those as separate spells. They've got one spell called fire, and, and everything else modifies that. And the other thing I did with the magic is because there are those systems where, you know, once you get to be a power, powerful enough mage, you're, you can just wipe everything out. Yep. Right. Um so I'm fairly yeah. certain you're I'm fairly certain you're aware of the um, tr of the trope of linear warriors quadratic wizards. Yes, yes. And so what I did with with the magic in my system is magic does general damage as opposed to specific hit point location damage. So it's much harder for a mage to kill. They certainly kill individuals. You can certainly be a combat mage, but it's it's more difficult. And really, the combat mage is better at. You know, crowd control, if you will, area control, and that casting that big area of effect can hit a bunch of targets, perhaps, but but it, they still have to either hit or or there's either a save or a two hit, depending on the spell type. So catching that formation of the enemy and, and making a bunch of them roll and some of them will fail and take some damage is cool, but you're not going to cast a you know cast a fireball on a bunch of humans uh, unless it's a very powerful one and and wipe them out. You're just going to soften them up a little bit, and it, it makes some really interesting interactions between the mages and the you know the fighter characters the melee or or ranged weapons if you do because they really have to support each other as opposed to the you know the mage basically saying hold my beer you know standing forth and and, and mowing down uh, the the bad guys yeah now given what you mentioned about that fire spell for example i i want to take that and run with it a little bit sure um, so within your system would somebody be able to use that fire spell and instead of instead of having it be a a um a ranged a ranged attack have it be a cone effect a la burning hands yes absolutely yes so you can define the spell effect when you take the base spell so the one thing that i would do is if you said i want to use the fire spell as a cone well that would be a separate spell than the fire spell as a sphere for example and there's once again, and there's enough, there's enough base, you know, I call them spell levels learned, but there, there's enough room to do this and get some flexibility. But yeah, you can, you can define, there's a few different area of effects that can be defined um, that I use in the book as an example to, to just to, to tell players, like, how do you, do you want it to be a line, right? So there's the classic line, there's, there's, the, there's the cone, uh, there's the sphere. Uh, so how do you want it to be? And you can define that. Um, and that's the thing about the magic system as well is I have, it's over 200 spells, um, but that's just for examples. So it's to give people ideas who don't want to think about their own and also to give you a power level, right? So you could say, hey, here's a bunch of level one spells, basically, and here's some level 20 spells, and here's all these things in between. So if I go to my game master and say, here's my vision of my character, here's what the spell I want, you can kind of compare that effect to, the other ones, and hopefully get a okay. This is going to be a, a level eight spell, basically. Mm -hmm. And with that, in, with that in mind, I know you have you have it listed that there are six spheres of magic. Um, Correct. All of all of them linked to a to a seventh. Um, what would what would the spheres of magic be, and what would they what um, area would they entail? Right. Yeah. So, and, and basically the, the, the lore is that humans, humanoids, you know, mortals kind of look at magic this way. Gods tend to look at it a little different, right? They control the whole spectrum, uh, even if they may kind of tend to focus on what we would, we mortals would consider a, a specific sphere, but for, for, for humanoid control and goblinoids the same uh, or whatever, uh, the, the spheres are elemental, which is the classic air, earth, fire, water. Um, illusion, uh, mental, so anything that affects the, the mind, nature, so affects living nature, and that's defined, you know, plant, animal kingdoms, necrotic, which is negative energy, which has some very specific connotations in, in, in my world, undead are powered by negative energy, uh, necrotic energy, the, the planes of hell and the abyss are powered, or really different dimensions or, or universes, I should say, planes. 
Um, and then the physical, which is body affecting spells and you know, basically positive energy, which is the life force of, of most living creatures. Mm -hmm. And then those all connect into the general. And the general is just that classic kind of ground for here's your anti-magic spheres, right? Here's your dispel magics. Here's these things that just don't fit in any of the other spheres, but you know, kind of, kind of meet there. And people can control them all. Um, it in the rules, you know, those who anyone who's mastered all six spheres, uh, you know, there's a power signature with with all these different spheres. So you can recognize the the, the spell. So, for instance, an elemental wizard, you know, if, if they're casting a spell, you're going to see uh, the the orange of, of that particular spell, right? So there's the primary colors, and then the, the between, like the mental is is purple. But someone who's powerful enough or a god, that magic is going to appear as black or white. Um, and so a, a mortal who's achieved that level is called a master of the circle. Um, and so if you, if you run into someone who's casting spells that are white or black, you're, 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 you may be in trouble unless you've come prepared. Mm -hmm. Now, with that, with, that in, with that in mind, a lot of games will have a limitation factor so that's so that people aren't just throwing spells out all, all the damn time right um, like in so, in something like warhammer you constantly have the risk of spe of spells going awry especially as you do more and more of them over the course of the over a day um shadow run of course has spell has spell drain and some some games will just will just use a spell point system what approach do you have in terms I am, of yeah of yeah I'm basically using the spell point system mm -hmm. I, I I ended up calling it magic endurance points uh, my editor and I had a conversation because it's such a build a spell system mm -hmm. that I had spell levels learned and you know it's spell points and spell points per hour regen per hour and so we changed a few terms we still call them spell points around the table but officially in the book they're magic endurance points and that is it when you cast a spell you know th those those uh, disappear as they would in spell points regenerate at a certain point in time and the other thing that's interesting about my system is you the base spell effect costs a certain amount so the the spell level is the is the base cost so if it's level one it's one if it's level 20 it's 20 um and then you multiply it by that rad that range area of effect and duration so if you're casting a, a spell that's point blank you know no range point target no duration it's very cheap uh, but if you're casting that across the, the battlefield or you're casting it with a big duration or a big area of effect, it really piles up fast. And the mages in my system you know, have had so much fun with, you can just see them making that decision like, oh man, I really want to wait for this moment because it's going to be so much cheaper to cast. So I'm going to try to set them up, you know, as opposed to just blazing away all the time, which you, if you're in trouble, maybe you do, but you make tactical decisions. The whole basis of this game is that the player's decisions matter, right? Like your vision and decisions matter. And I want the mage to be like, do I use this now? Do I use this here? This is going to burn a lot of spell points, but maybe it's worth it. Um, you know, you'll, you'll find like on the buff spells, like the caster going, hey, everyone try to get around me. I'm going to do an area of effect and we want to get as many people in there as we can. So if you gather together and then the, the enemy mages throw, you know, something at you, well, was that a smart idea or not? So so it it, it forces those decisions of how do I cast this and, and, and uh, you know, do I, do I want to make it? Because you can always cast a lower level spell. If I have the ability to cast for, say, D4 rounds as a duration or 2D4 rounds as a duration, well, the 2D4 is going to cost me twice as much as the one D4 does. So, you know, is that worth it or not? You know, where are we at in the battle? Do I want to try to conserve some points? So you're, you're always making those choices uh, during combat. Mm -hmm. Now, I'll, now when it comes to, speaking of combat, let's, I want to get into that a bit because as I've mentioned in the past with a lot of fantasy games, there's the, there's the temptation to give a lot of attention to the um, caster types and, Subsequently, they end up getting more game out of the, well, game, than the martial types. Um, in, your, in your system, I know you, you've, men you've mentioned the whole thing with attacks and parries. So I'm, I'm guessing that the action economy of combat is something that is significantly important. Yes. Yeah, and, and the combat system is segment. And I and I like a segmented combat system because it prevents all these issues of 
do, so how many actions do I get versus minor actions versus reactions? For, you know, I mean, that, that, that kind of thing confuses me. And, and I'm, I'm an old infantry guy, so I get confused easily. So I liked the, the segment system because if you say, how long I've been knocked prone, how long does it take to get up? It takes 15 segments to get up. How long does it take to draw a weapon? It takes five segments to draw a weapon. How long does it take to, you know, to resheathe that weapon? Five segments, but if you're in a hurry, you might want to drop it, which is zero segments. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the, so the combat system is the same way in that you know, characters have a left side and right side action. Um, and so that's if you're fighting you know, dual weapon or sword and shield or whatever platform. Now, if you're fighting two two handed weapons, so you're fighting with a great sword or a missile weapon or casting, you know, takes effectively both both actions. But you know, it gives you that decision making process of it's going to take me a certain amount of time to ready a weapon to strike, um, and and there's also short, medium, and long strokes for a melee weapon, for example, and they have higher potential damage as you go on. So if you're if you're wielding a uh, say a medium sword, uh, you know, an arming sword or, or something. It's it's like well, I can and and these speeds these speeds decrease in that you're faster with higher decks, but also as your skill goes up. So you can sit there with that sword, that back sword, and say, hey, I can do a short stroke at nine segments, which has you know D five damage potential, assuming no modifiers. D five damage potential. I can wait to thirteen segments, which has D seven. You know, do I want to do I want to wait? And the other thing is that when you use a weapon it resets so if you use your long sword yeah that that weapon is now reset and so you, you have to wait to even parry with it um you know if you use a shield and there's some shield rules like if you're in a shield wall there's adv there's certain advantages but like hey i just used a shield to parry this and there's another shot coming in from a different direction and i haven't had time to reset my shield so you get characters in combat saying hey, there's some guy stabbing me with a short sword. I'm going to count on my armor taking care of that because there's a halberd coming over the top in a couple segments, and I'm going to hold my parry with my shield for that halberd if he hits. So so once again, this is this is the whole design of the game to deliberately you know, give you those choices in combat. And, and, and so that's one thing about this game. If you're one of those, like a social gamer, you want to sit there once around, you want to roll the dice and go back to drinking beer, it's definitely not the combat system for you. Um, but having said that, I've had players in my game, in fact, I have one right now who had never played a role-playing game before of any kind, made a character has come in and has done fine. So if, if you're willing to be engaged, you know, I, it's, I think it's awesome, of course, because I made what I wanted to play. But you, you definitely have to pay attention because there's there's opportunities. There's also combat tactics, which are available to everyone. So that's another thing, right? Some games make you, hey, do you want to buy Shield Bash? Or do you want to buy uh, this, these other... Combat tactics are available to anyone. So you can fend, where if you have a longer weapon that's a, that's a fending weapon, mm -hmm. and someone's trying to come into you with a shorter weapon... You, you can fend them and try to keep them from even engaging with you. You can press. You can form a shield wall, which really makes your parries go up. So there's these things that you can do that encourage the players to work together. And we even get a lot of, we'll be having a combat, and one of the players will say, hey, I'm going on segment you know, 27. When's your shot? Hey, I'm about 27 too. I'll throw my shot at 27, take their parry away, and then you take that shot at 28, and hopefully we'll get a hit. Um, you, you know, and and the opponent may have taken the first one with the shield, and maybe they had a parry with their weapon too. And they rather than take their attack, they go, "Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna use my parry to to parry this other shot coming in." So it, it, there's a lot of tactical intricacy, even though the game itself, you're going on your segment and you have a percent chance to hit, and and those are modified, but but it's not even heavily modified. Um, you know, a, a target has a defense, and then there's a couple other modifiers on occasion, but it's, it's, it's not designed to, hey, let's add up the five different modifiers that we have and add and subtract and figure out where we're at. Um, in fact, sometimes when a player goes, what's my chance on this? I'm like, just roll the dice, right? If you've got a 60-something percent chance to hit and you roll a 30, we don't need to even you know, think about it. Mm -hmm. And with that, in, with that in mind, we've t we talked about how the how, um, how the percentile how the percentile chance of success is gen is generated how does how does parrying and how does ar and how does um armor um factor in factor into that chance of success yeah so so parrying itself 
is 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 a skill right so you can take shield and you can put attack into shield but of course most people take shield for parry so you it's just like any other skill there's going to be an easy average hard or very hard rating um and it sets like a weapon and the thing with parrying is you don't have to declare it unless your opponent hits so that was something from a game mechanic perspective when i first built the rules it's like when someone declared attack you had to declare parry but that actually diminish the advantage too much of experienced characters, right? Because you have, say, two first-level characters equivalent swing at you that each have a 25% chance to hit. Well, you have to pick one to parry, and you're an experienced person. I got to pick one to parry when they declare. Mm -hmm. Well, then both of them probably miss, right? Or, or so, so the nice thing is you only have to parry if the opponent hits, if you choose to, um, and, and, and then, you know, you roll your parry and you succeed or not. And there can be some blow through, right? If you're parrying with a dagger and someone's swinging a halberd at you, you know, that, that damage can blow through. Um, and then if it does blow through or you miss your parry or you choose not to parry, uh, then armor absorbs. Uh, now a critical hit ignores armor. So it's the class. I do have, I do have some fancier rules for people who prefer, uh, you know, effects rather than that. But the, the, a critical hit ignores armor, uh, but but if not, and some and missile weapons at short enough range will either get you know ignore armor or, or get half damage. Uh, but that way, if you're wearing plate, for example, plate absorbs seven damage, mm -hmm. right? So we were we were talking about a you know a medium sized sword that if, if you've got a if you're going to throw a medium stroke with a with a with a medium sized sword hitting someone in plate unless you get a critical hit or you've got a damage bonus you're not even going to get through right so you better go for long strokes which makes sense right you don't you don't short stroke once again unless you're just totally desperate and trying to hit a gap which would be the equivalent of a critical so what i also do with armor because armor in my mind actually makes it slows you down and makes it easier to hit Right, so I was pretty generous on the first few Gambison type levels of hey, light armor, light armor, light armor. But as soon as you get up to chain, it actually reduces your defense, slows you, slows down your. So and the, and the weapon matched up in that you know, the, the maximum damage with a dagger. So if you take a long stroke with a dagger, your maximum damage is D6. You know, fighting someone with a dagger. In play unless you get a critical you know or you've got them immobilized somehow you're, it's not going to happen so the so the systems are all designed like that the short sword does a long stroke with a short sword does d8 for example so if you get lucky you know with a with a short sword and hit someone in full play and roll max damage you're going to do one point of damage which on a humanoid is you know if you hit them enough times you'll eventually take them down but you're not going to take them down with one shot mm -hmm. now with that, with that in mind, I know I, given the st given the style of um, play that you get that you're going for, a lot of well, a lot of games will have uh, will have of course their list of bestiaries. Do you plan on having some advice for GMs if they want to create their own monster that isn't on the list? Yes, I already that's in the rules as it is. Um, one thing I didn't put in the rules is I didn't put in a big monster list. Um, but I put how to build them. Um, I do have an online bestiary, um, and, it, and it's and it's a sample one. I have some creatures in it because my players. I'll throw real monsters in there. But I've got a I've got a new one coded um, that I'll be releasing before the end of this year, and I plan on putting lots of creatures in there. But I also plan on putting out instructions. I'll probably just do it as a PDF um, and, and post it up on you know Drive Through RPG or whatever of. Here's my creature builder because this system is specifically designed, as you as you've no doubt intuited. Um, you just put the primary attributes together, you know, and the you add up the primary attributes, and that will give you the the fame level, the fame rank of the creature based on the primary attributes. You add the skills; it tells you how to add the skills. And then what I've done is assigned values to like what is a troll's regeneration worth, right? Like how many fame points or experience points is that worth? And so, hey, I'm going to plug on regeneration. You know, that's an extra 200 fame points. Um, so you could just build whatever creature you want. And in fact, sometimes for a game, I'll just build a quick throwaway creature, right? I don't want some cannon creature, but I want some specific things. I'll throw it together, you know, just throw together those attributes and it's, it's easy and then I'm done. And then when the game's done, then you never see that creature again. Um, when it comes to when it comes to damage, when I looked at the damage char um chart on the Kickstarter page, right? Um, I I'm guessing that I'm guessing that damage is a die, but then I but then I see things like D seven. I'm like, 
I'm not allowed to use non-Euclidean dice. Yeah, well, in my game, you are, you are. See, that's the beauty. We're going to give you a freedom you've never had before. Yeah, and and that was because I used to have the, the standard dice sizes, right? And, and and one of the problems with standard dice size, the, the, the weapon speed and damage is actually a formula. And the formulas are in the book, right? It's not buried in formulas because most people don't care about them. But I, I put in the formulas for game masters who want to create their own weapons, you know, uh, or just take it apart and say, I'm going to improve Randy's formula and, and make it cooler. So I always love when someone would include kind of the designer's notes, if you will, right? Like, here's how they built this so you can build your own. Mm -hmm. So I, the, the, so the, the thing is, as the weapon is heavier, it's weapon type plus length, plus, or not plus, but weapon type, length, and weight affect both the speed and the base damage. And the problem was you want to give players choices, right? And that if I'm taking a heavier weapon, I'm going to do more damage, but I'm going to be slower. And the problem with, with rounding off to, you know, dice is found in nature, as we call it in the book, is that it, it, it ruins the balance. Some weapons become better than others. So I, it was with great trepidation that I said, ah, you know, if I could just do like a D5, right? Or, or you know, say a halberd, the max on a halberd is, and, and, and there's a formula that affects this a little bit, but there, there's D17 damage. I'm like... I'll have to try that at the table. And, and I was a little nervous about it, but the fact is we never missed a beat on it. Um, you know, so yeah, a, a halberd long stroke D17, you know, plus three knockback, which there's some knockback rules for flattening people or knocking them out of the, you know, out of the, the hex, as it were, if you're playing with hexes. Um, so I just, I like it. You know, obviously a game master went in there and said, my players, you know, don't want to roll D17. Well, great. Make it D20, you know, make it whatever works. But, but I think from a balance perspective, it really gives you... Each weapon gives you something, as opposed to no one's ever going to use this weapon because you know if you take this one, it's just as fast, but it does another you know two points of damage or something. So mm -hmm. I, I, I wanted to I wanted there's no weapon in there that doesn't give you some choice. Um, and I also do have you know once again that that's where the skill system comes in too because you know like a short sword is easy to use, so you can take that short sword. You can get there are situations where you're fighting a bunch of really small creatures. Uh, For inside this thing, these creatures in my world called chitters, you know, which they're 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 mass attack troops, you know, and 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 they get slaughtered. You see, well, a guy with a short sword or a woman with a short sword can can really hack up, as opposed to the person wielding a great sword who's really slow, uh, you know. So 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 I, I want those those trade offs to be good, uh, you know, for the player to say, how do I want my vision of the character to go when I'm choosing my weapon selection. And once again, you run into a situation with someone with heavy armor and I've got a short sword. Well, I'm not going to try to stab him from the front. Maybe I go around from behind to take advantage of that. I get increased chance to hit you double critical from behind chance of critical. So, you know, it, it forces you, or it doesn't force you, but it, it means that you can use some tactics to improve your odds based on the situation. Or even there, there's grappling in my game as well. So sometimes if, you know, if, if I've got a dagger and I've got an experienced guy, you know, wearing plate and a, and a, a great sword, I'm probably going to just try to tackle him because that's my best chance to survive at that point. And with that, with all that in mind, what are you shooting for as far as a total page count? The page count at this point, everything's done. Uh, you know, and you, and you say everything's done. You know how that works. You're in the, yeah. in the gaming world. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Everything's done, but the art. And so I don't know. And some quotes. I've got some great quotes from over the years that I may throw in to you know kind of fill some spaces and stuff. So current page count is one sixty five. So the art will push that out and some of the others. So I'm not sure exactly where it will come out. Um, but but it, it won't be materially more than that. I'm not going to add any whole new sections. Like I, I've been tempted. Do I add a, a list of creatures for the bestiary, you know, for example? And, and I just don't think, you know, those are all things that I can put out separately. Um, and, and and from a core rulebook perspective, I don't think they're, they're critical. Um, I've got a bunch of lore for my campaign too. So for people who want to run... You know, in in my world, uh, you know, there, there's 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 going to be lore available, so they'll be able to get all that stuff if if a game master wants a little little help, uh, you know, running their campaign. Mm -hmm. And I do want to I do want to offer my congrats for how well the Kickstarter is do, is doing at the time of this recording. You yeah, were thank you. For I'm shocked. And you're at twenty one hundred. You're at twenty one hundred and change. Um, what are you shooting for as far as a release window? Not a hard date, but a general estimate. Yeah, and, and that was the tricky part. Uh, you know, this is the first print-on-demand book I've done. Uh, you know, so I feel very confident with 
hey, I, the mechanics, I'm solid. My ability to run a business, I've run multiple businesses. I feel really good about all that, but printing is, is something outside my purview. And, and one of the issues that, for instance, Print On Demand is having right now is they're saying, if you submit a proof, it's going to take us up to five days to look at it, you know, 25 plus days to, to get it printed, never mind the mailing and then mail. So I was like, okay, so that's, let's just call that a month. So if I send a proof, that's a month. If the proof is perfect, that's a month to even ship it to Kickstarter backers. So that's two months plus whatever time it takes to ship. And God knows I probably won't do it right the first time. So I need to add, uh, you know, another another date on that. So that's the one part I was really dicey about, honestly, because I was like, I don't want to disappoint. Yeah, I'd rather under promise and over deliver, um, but I'm not really sure. So I, I bumped it out and I said, you know, I'm just gonna I'm gonna pick a far away date and hopefully that doesn't turn people off the Kickstarter. And I picked August 2022 for the delivery. I even thought like maybe I'll do PDFs faster, which hopefully I will anyway. But I'll say no, I'm just gonna put August 2022 on everything. And if I deliver faster, I deliver faster. And and I do think you know I was really shocked by the Kickstarter. You know, I, I've run businesses. I know how to market. I know how to do all that stuff. But this is a passion project, and I and I didn't want to do the marketing, right? You know, um, and you do a little, you try to be smart about it, but I didn't want to go out there and really shake the tree and build a big community and do all that. Um, so I dropped it on, you know, the only marketing I did is posted it on my personal Facebook page. Um, and there was probably about 10 servers that I'm active enough in where I felt I could drop that. I didn't want to drop it anywhere where like I just lurk or whatever, but so that's the only marketing done. And, and it, I was a little nervous you know, I put 300 as a goal and thought, well, I'll probably get that, but you know, hopefully. Uh, but I'll t I'll tell you just a, you know, truth between us and the monastery here is I'm like, man, if I get to a thousand, I'm gonna be so excited, uh, you know. And then I went a the thousand, then I went above two, and then I kept, you know, two thousand something, 1997, you know, two thousand something, 19, you know, it went back and forth a little bit to tease me, and uh, you know, hopefully we're above that far enough now where we're we're, we're staying above two. Mm -hmm. Well, I will certainly be looking forward to, to seeing how th how things develop and I do I wish you all the I'm not going to wish you all the best of luck because I do not want to jinx things <laughs> nice but with all that said I would like to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness at play here and anytime you see fit to return to the temple the door is always open as awesome. I often say around here Drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Right, right. It does get you through the door. So, yeah, no, I, I appreciate it. It's been very fun. I love talking about games and gaming, so I'm always happy to visit. I'm always happy to talk, you know, not just about the Lords of Chaos stuff, but it, game mechanics and building a game and that experience. Uh, you know, like I said, I feel I feel pretty comfortable on that side of things. And uh, it, it's just, it's fun, and it's, it's, and it's fun to support people on the same journey, right? So people making their own games, uh, you know, doing their own thing. If if I can share the, the you know things I've learned along the way, and I've learned a lot, I'm always happy to do so. Mm -hmm. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers, present and not present. My name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! <laughs>